This episode is brought to you by Domestique by Homecraft. It's the holidays, or it's your birthday, or it's the gender announcement for your fake pregnancy. And look, none of your family has shown up because they have their own lives and they're really selfish and they say they're tired of dealing with your constant horseshit. Well, a lot of people would say that's sad, but it doesn't have to be. Not when you receive your shipment from Domestique, a full and varied collection of blank human-shaped cardboard stand-ups for you to color and dress to create a complete supportive family unit surrounding you in love when you need them most. And now your pitiable occasion has become... Well, it's not sad, it's life-affirming. Hey, Dad showed up. Gee, I hope he doesn't drink too much. He'll just get all huggy and tell you how proud he is of you. So embarrassing. And here's your unmarried Aunt Dee Dee recounting her last solo vacation. Aunt Dee Dee has always been your hero. Why, yes, Dee Dee, these were a great idea. Yes, I'd be glad to tell you where I got them. And your sister and her husband have shown up. <sighs> so judgy. Give me a break. Oh, it looks like her husband got fired for having an affair at work. He's on the sex offender list? Well, I'm sure you'll bounce right back. Let me give you a hug. And order now with the promo code RERED to try Cardboard Pets for when imaginary humans are too much trouble. And thank you, Domestique by Homecraft, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. This episode is brought to you by the support of generous listeners just like you. You can learn how to be one of them at patreon.com slash rereadingwolf. And thank you, listener patrons, for supporting the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Hi, Craig. Hello. Merry Christmas, holidays, whatever you're doing. I don't know what time it is. I know know what day it is. What happens if someone hears this for the first time in June? Then when, how's that going to feel? Yeah. <laughs> then happy summer and in a time when it's light outside and maybe my mind is working more clearly instead of being crazy. December is always nuts. Well, I don't know. I, we have a lot to do. We, you want to just get on to these comments? Yep. Let's do it. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Craig, I keep getting ideas about this chapter. Uh, I keep, I think I mentioned that to you. You know, that, that scene, Severian wakes up from a dream as Thecla. And, you know, I was already talking about the fact that Severian, it seems like someone keeps nudging him awake. Uh, it makes me think that Jonas must wake up as bio Jonas when he wakes up. And that's kind of a parallel to Severian waking up as Thecla. I like that. I like that. And that's, that's a real question. I mean, if you, yeah, because depending on, like we said, who you think Jonas is at any given time. Yeah. And if he's splitting, yeah. Then who he wakes here as is significant since it mirrors a lot of other things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see regarding the curiositus earthus that Hathor Alzabod his entire crew and that they are all inside him. <laughs> you know, this was based on the theory that Wolf was riffing off of the 19th century poem, the yarn of the Nancy bell. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Andre Druisi so says on Reddit, Regarding Wolf making cryptic references to obscure Victorian poetry, he definitely did that in VRT of the Fifth Head of Cerberus, beginning, quote, a Polish count, a knight grand cross, RX and QED, which comes from a humorous poem in the comic almanac of, for 1841. Uh, th and by the way, you can uh, get this reference as well in in Michael's chapter guide for Gene Wolfe's first four yeah, novels. Which definitely is a worthwhile thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I already had a bunch of his chapbooks, so this is like an update of those, and it's all in one place and fits on the shelf. Yeah. He knows that the poem is entitled Twelfth Night, in parentheses, not Shakespeare's. He also wants to add to his list of dioramas in this book. He, this one... You know, he, in the past, he's he's labeled them hour of something, whatever. And this one, he wants to call it hour of possession because Severian wakes up possessed by Thecla 
in this chapter. And there's also the question of which personality is in charge of Jonas, as we mentioned. And then he says, the effect of just these two cases amounts to hour of possession in the, quote, hall of mirrors. But there's more, he says. Craig pokes around at the question of what does Jonas see in Jalinta when given the explanation for Jalinta's vavavoom is hypnosis and cosmetic surgery. Craig reaches for something non-materialistic and gets very close to what I call possession. That is, even though the techniques involved seem mundane, the results are demonstrably supernatural. If Jalinta is possessed by a lust demon, that would fit the bill. Yeah, in the same way that I think programming could be a kind of possession. I mean, it's 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 metaphorically similar, um, just like in Long Sun, possession also becomes a kind of, you know, it's technically a mundane thing because it's science fictional, but it's, yeah, but it still works like demonic possession. I don't know about that one. <laughs> But you could call it, I guess you could call it the hypnosis, a lust demon, all, you know, all of her additions. I guess you could call it that. In this, yeah, in this context, it's the reason I think that's useful to think about here is because then it suggests that what's going on with Jonas is also a kind of possession. And that certainly gives right. us some kind of way to think about it. But it does also seem to me that Wolf's really pushing on a different way to think about the identity meshing here, which is not possession. Cause I, the whole point of possession, I think is the idea that there is one proper identity and one invasive identity. And what's sort of special about Jonas is that in the end, maybe we have a third or a new one where neither is a, is but Jonas himself. Yeah. Right. Jonas himself. Exactly. Who's neither proper nor invasive. And right. that's, that's the difference. Let's see. What else? Uh, Pantopsilis on Reddit. Uh, you know, I was thinking maybe when Severian talks about the white alloys, that maybe he was talking about plastic. Pantopsilis says, quote, the light metal Jonas is made from could be simply meant to be some form of aluminum. Mm -hmm. Japanese one yen coins are made from aluminum, and it really is kind of unnerving how light they are. Or something light like tin. Yeah. And Adolf Hitler agrees with that. He says, that was that was my interpretation. I read this as a reference to aluminum. That being said, am I right in assuming that Jonas's robot parts are hollow like Sidero's? Yeah, that was kind of my initial thought was that, I don't know that if that was like a way that, I don't know, when Wolf got around to, new, to Earth of the New Sun, he was thinking of ways to explain it or something. But I mean, yeah, Jonas is just not as big, you know, there's. Yeah. Yeah. Hollow for Sidero means hollow in which a human could fit inside. It's different from being like hollow, like bird bones. Yeah. He's too small for a real human to fit inside yeah. him. But it would be very satisfying if mm -hmm. Sidero somehow be had become Jonas in some way. Yeah. 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 For no other reason than that one moment when Sidero and Severian get their awareness mixed up, it'd be fun to at least believe that Severian and Jonas could be mixed up for a second there. But. And then the uh, ex defo really likes the idea that hey, Thor, you know, consumed his entire uh, ship complement. <laughs> but he says, I really am firmly in the camp that Wolf gave us all the information and everything is part of the solution to the riddle he presents us with. And it's not really clear to me, but I think he's saying that he doesn't really buy into all of these extra elusive interpretations of Wolf's text. I think he's saying he thinks that if there's any information to be had, Wolf put it there directly in the book. And trying to spin off some information extra textually from the book is walking down a dead end path, right? Yep. And could well be, in which case... You're probably going to get irritated if you keep listening. <laughs> I don't read it that way. All I can say. Uh, Adolf Hutler also says uh, something that struck me in this chapter. A Hathor's creature left a slimy trail over Jonas, but otherwise did no harm in this chapter. Much later in Sword of the Lictor, when Severian encounters, presumably, the same creature in the village of the sorcerers, it easily consumes one of them upon touch. 
Severian speculates that it may have hunted by thought because it was drawn to the sorcerer's intensely focused mind as he wove a spell around him. Hmm. It could be. could be. I mean, we don't know anything about it other than the fact that it didn't. I mean, it could also have been that it was not liking Jonas's robot parts. You know, we just don't know. We just know that it, if it is the same creature, even that it, yeah, left Jonas alone and went after something else. Well, that's the kind of the question though. Was it the same creature? Um, we don't know. <laughs> so I'd like to postulate whether it was. I mean, he he points out that the creature was far more deadly uh, and dangerous, you know, in the sorcerer's village, and that may be an argument that it wasn't the same creature at all. But Neil San Pedro Last night I dreamt of San Pedro. answers that the reason why Jonas wasn't hurt is because Hathor and his creatures aren't attempting at all to harm Severian or his friends in any way. And that's the reason that they could seem arbitrarily dangerous. Obviously, I find that uh, a very appealing theory. But I, I had asked, well, you know, what is the whole point of Hathor, if that's true, releasing a critter? And uh, Neil San Pedro says, quote, in this particular case, Hathor and his pets are creating panic with the consequent distraction in the antechamber that was necessary for Severian and Jonas to wander around in the Hypogean unstopped. And notice that the antechamber guards aren't where they're supposed to be when Severian is looking for the sword. Hmm. Could be. I mean, I get where he's going with it. I just, that seems like a lot of work to bring in an interdimensional critter just to be a distraction while a couple people are wandering around for a little while. You know, it, like, and that's, and that's even that you didn't necessarily know that they were escaping right then. The right. Point. Well, no one seems upset or distracted actually by the critter. It would be one thing if all the guards were rushing in while Severian right. and Jonas were sneaking out the door. I think mean, I'd like that. I'd like for that to be true because it would allow me to come up with a consistent theory. <laughs> also, Pentopsilus has a few speculations regarding uh, various uh, theories that have been you know, pitched during the these last few chapters. He says, the first one, if Hathor and Jonas are indeed avoiding or antipathetic to each other, maybe Jonas was the Notchul's intended target. Wow. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, he is human enough that there would be some some warmth there, some actual life. I suppose, yeah. He does breathe. Yeah. So that's entirely possible. Yeah. yeah. But we know that he's human enough. That yeah. Well, he was running like he was afraid, so he must have seen him as a threat. I wonder what kind of threat he would be to a robot. It'd be kind of interesting. I don't know. Scary. Otherwise, like if they couldn't hurt him, it would seem like it would make more sense to say like, just, you run, Severian. I'll have him distract. Like, come after me and they can't hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll distract them. He definitely could yeah. get hurt and he seemed to be aware of that. Let's see. Uh, his, his second speculation. Following on from the suggestion in the podcast about how mirror travel functions, maybe Hathor himself has come through a mirror at some point. If he is testing Severian somehow, then the risk of his pets actually harming him is less of a concern if Hathor is working in multiple universes. Even if this universe's Severian is eliminated, there will still be other Severians to work with. Sure, yeah. But I still, I mean, the more we get into this, we always have to remember that the Occam's razor of Orc, as you has him and just says, hey, bring me a monster to go kill this guy. I want dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, he does keep bringing them, but I don't know. I I find the whole thing suspicious. I, I get that. I, that. I mean, I held that a theory for a long time and it didn't make any sense either. So...
It is the season for giving and gratefulness, so we'd like to say how thankful we are for the generosity you guys have given us on Patreon. And we have new folk to thank this time. So first, Leonard Eastlick is our new journeyman. Thank you so much, Leonard, for signing up. Remember, if you sign up at journeyman level of $2 per month, you get access to everything we put up on Patreon. Right now, that means a series of discussions of Jorge Luis Borges stories and essays. Uh, James has posted a bunch of short essays and summaries of different topics, as well as some other good goodies sprinkled throughout. Then at the master level, which is $5 per month or more, uh, we'll give you a custom audio tag that we'll use if we read your comments on the show. Plus, you'll get some extras throughout the year like stickers and bits of art and other things we haven't even thought of yet. So since the last episode, we did have three new master level patrons. Taylor Chaparro. Chaparro. George Terry. George can take a track with troopies on his back, carrying the packs and ammo. And Cody Bazance. Cody says he didn't start the fire. His parents know he probably did. Thank you again to all the patrons, and we so appreciate everything that you guys have done for us. All right, so we got to move on, Craig. Um, are we moving on or are we moving backwards? Uh, that's, well, let's figure that out. Because <laughs> I think we've done, we put out 19, so now we're going back. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we're, we're going back in the book because we, we skipped 17, chapter 17, this one, and we went to, directly to 18. Now we're going back. We're going to do 17. So, yeah, we're going backwards in the book. I don't know. I think maybe we're going backwards in the story. But you know, let me tell you a story, Craig. <laughs> Sit down. I'll, I'll get a little pillow. I'll read. It'll be nice. Nice. As long as you don't fall asleep because you don't know what's going on, which is a great strategy in certain <laughs> in certain contexts. That's exactly what you want. Hopefully not in this one. Chapter 17, The Tale of the Student and His Son. Part one, The Redoubt of the Magicians. We should stop for a second and say that the way we're going to do this is a little different. We're not even going to pretend to try to do one episode that summarizes and clarifies and unlocks everything in the Brown Book stories. Um, I don't think we'll do any of them quite that way, but this one rather in particular, <laughs> I feel like is, is there's all so much going on in so many ways you can do it that, that we'll probably split this up and we'll go on to do more chapters and then come back to this. And we may do this with some of the other stories as well, um, just because they are obviously so weird and strange and doing so many different things. I like the way you put it too, James, and I don't, if, if I'm jumping ahead from something you wrote, then I'll, I'll take this. Out no, go ahead. That's right. But you had said too, that in a lot of ways, one thing about these stories is that they work like poems where they're mm -hmm. not meant to be summarized, that yeah. they really are functioning as more like prose poems in a yeah. lot of ways where yeah, oh, they're definitely like there's, there's a lot going on here that some of it is absolutely referential. Some of it is absolutely talking about what's going on in the story as a whole. But then there's a whole other level here where what Wolf has done with all the Brown Book stories is of course made things that are somewhat familiar, but a lot too of what he's doing, I think is meant to be straight up strange. In other words, mm -hmm. it's not meant to be something that you decode and figure out what the, the true meaning is that a lot of what he's doing here is trying to really, really create that atmosphere of historical difference and distance and change by making familiar things seem unfamiliar. So yeah. I think there are definitely times when a lot of the weirdness is there to be dislocating and dissociating and, and really to set you off, but not something that you're supposed to treat like ah, a clue for some <laughs> other, you know, where we're going. Yeah. Where we're going or even to be an illusion or to be something else that I think there is a lot of this that is fun to ha be reading a story that you just flat out don't understand um, a bit like sort of surrealist in, in a sense. And that's kind of, I think one of the things he's saying about how history functions is that it kind of makes certain things unintelligible. So there are people who do want to take all the Brown book stories apart. And I think that there are aspects of them that absolutely you can't. 
I don't think that's everything. I don't think that everything in here works that way. And I think we would drive ourselves crazy and probably spend the rest of our lives trying to do that if we did actually try to go sentence by sentence and figure out what everything (laughs) means. Um, But we're still going to do our best to talk about everything. We're just not going to try and present everything at once. Because I think, honestly, the more I read it, the less I exactly understand. So it's just too intimidating <laughs> to, to, to think that I could. And I and frankly, I don't think I should. Yeah, I, I think, think we're just going to I think the, the the plan here is we're just going to read it and we're going to make comments as we go. Yep. We brought this up in the, in the comments, but for you who might have skipped the comments to get straight to the chapter, uh, this takes place at the end of chapter 16 when Jonas is breaking down. It's a, it's a variant says that he just talked to Jonas for a while, just saying whatever came to his head, and Jonas didn't say anything back. And so Severian just opens up the brown book and reads a story at random. Yep. I guess this is our, we, we moved on to chapter 18 to try to finish Jonas's story, but now here we're going to come back to this and see what we can make of it. Yeah, and, and like you said, this story, as I see it, is an example of what Ada Palmer called clutter in Wolf's world building in her excellent introduction to Tor's recent edition of Shadow and Claw. Yeah. And where can people, if they haven't read that, where can they find her discussing that? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We talked about that for just over in, an hour. <laughs> just in case you're one of those people who's coming because you're like, ah, I want to know what the student and son is like. I'll listen to this podcast. Well, guess right. what? We talked to Ada Palmer, too, and she's awesome, yeah. and you should go listen to that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Commercial, real commercial over. Anyway, this, th- this story has multiple simultaneous layers of storytelling that's going on. It, it, it's like a, a multi-story house. It has a first floor with a kitchen, a den, a toilet, but then it also has a second story <laughs> with bedrooms and a couple showers and a sunroof, something entirely different going on. And it's all sitting on the same concrete pad or you know, even on a basement, which to, you know, to make the metaphor even more complicated. <laughs> so as I see it, Craig, This story is built chronologically on a real event in Severian's world, or at least his multiverse. I I believe that event is one that Jonas, the robot, or Jonas, the human, was involved in and remembers. And that's why Severian reads it at this point, choosing at random. And that would make sense, especially for the first time that Wolf's going to tell a brown book story. That mm-hmm. it, it is probably going to have a little bit more direct relevance to exactly what's going on here. Whereas I feel like some of the other ones are more about general world building in, uh, you know, New Sun right. World yeah. overall. Especially like the storytelling contest and things like that. Like, I, exactly. I feel of all the stories, this is the one that you can probably make some much more specific connections to exactly what's going on in this definitely this part of the story so there is if i i think wolf for this one is doing a little bit of uh you know working on the learning curve because <laughs> these are here whereas some of the other ones are just we're just going to tell you weird stories that yeah 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 and definitely the the storytelling contest is like that that's something that he added on after yeah. everything was written yeah and we should say too that we're saying that that it is tied to that usually people will start talking about the story and a mention it and immediately say, oh, well, isn't this just a weird retelling of the Theseus and the Minotaur story? And yes, it is. that, And we're going to talk about that. (laughs) Um, And then also, isn't it also connected to the battle, the Civil War battle of the Monitor and the the Merrimack and the Monitor? Is that right? Merrimack? Yeah, yeah. Entirely possible. Yeah, the Monitor and the Merrimack. And yeah, yeah. Entirely possible. I think that's absolutely true. It's sort of like a mashup of those. But there is a big kernel of it that, yeah, we think is definitely going on right. that's specifically related to Jonas. Right, exactly. And so we have this historical event, someone's related, but then over the thousands and thousands of years, I say it, it fell into the hands of an astronomer of a different language and culture who, as explained in Hamlet's Mill, described the events of astronomy, not in the language of mathematics, but in the language of myth. And I know I've said this whole book is trying to manage that act of interpretation, but in this particular story, I think it is never more clear than, than right here. And you can actually follow this story in a one-to-one uh, explanation of mapping it over the sky. And I'm going to follow that interpretive path as we go. 
And I think nowhere in Wolf's stories is there a more one-to-one -one relationship to the cosmic layer than in this story right here. There's really no way to check the validity of my real world <laughs> interpretation or Craig's or the cosmic world interpretations. I'm going to, you know, personally tell those two stories as they happen, as I see it. And the only verification will be that they don't conflict with each other or with Severian's story as a whole. There are no prizes if I'm right, <laughs> just like everyone else. I do promise to play fair. I'll try to call it out if we come upon something that even might undercut my reading. Yeah. And so just to say, I'm we're definitely letting James's take and and the sort of Hamlet's Mill story form the the sort of backbone of how we're talking about it. I've got a whole lot of other things that I'm going to be throwing in about what I think is going on. After talking to James about this part for so long, um, I really feel like he's caught on to something with this one that just feels right at this point. Um, and also I should say that uh, you've, you've written this up before. Like you, you literally do have a book that's based yeah, on, I, you have written up. Like I remember I, you sent this to me even before we even thought about the podcast, but, but you to me long, like years ago when you had an early draft of it. And it's 30,000 words, Craig, it's, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it, it sort of forms the core of how you connected Hamlet's mill to everything else. You're right. So this is super, super, super important to, I know how you think about everything. And if there are people who have sort of have questions about, well, okay, mm -hmm. I get Hamlet's Mill sort of in general, but sometimes when you guys talk about it, I don't know exactly how it's, it's fitting together. This, this will hopefully really explain in a whole lot of detail how that, that works. Um, and we're, so like you said, we're going to use that as really the skeleton of how we go through it, but I'm also going to throw in some other things along the way yeah. that are, are different sort of takes. And I'll, we'll mention things that, you know, other people have said that Mark said that, that, uh, Wright exactly. said, yeah. different people. Said. So, yeah. all right. You have the original historical story. It falls in the hands uh, of another culture, another language of a of an astronomer who takes with this uh, from this historical story and creates a metaphor of it for the night sky. And now it has become, in that sense, in the Hamlet's Mill sense, a myth. And there's also another layer, and that's the layer of Wolf as the author. And it's true. You know, Wolf loved puns. Parallels to the American U.S. Civil War Ironside ship, the Monitor, have been drawn. I'm going to tell you the truth, Craig. I'm not overly excited about that one. Uh, some might be surprised at that. No. But, but it, you know, if you tell me the Minotaur is the Monitor, I would kind of want to know where the Merrimack is. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of people think I just make you know a plausible mm -hmm. just so stories, but I really do want them to solve the gaps that I've already identified. If it's an illusion. I want the illusion to carry through to some degree. So if anyone has some more clarity on how the monitor pun is being carried through in some way, I definitely want to hear that. Good. I've got some ideas. So when we get there, okay. we'll definitely, definitely talk about that. Oh, terrific. And now, uh, not that Wolf is above casual puns and dad jokes, <laughs> you know, the, the, the thesis, Theseus pun uh, might be intentional, you know, a thesis of a student, and it might be the reason why the story is called the tale of the student, right? Just to clarify, because a student is one who writes a thesis, just in case you just to, just to absolutely spell <laughs> just every to drill bit it out. down yeah, for right. you exactly. dense dumb wits. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're going to see in the beginning of the story, there's a nod to Borges as well. So as a cosmic myth, a myth about time, I, I've touched on this before, but let's reiterate. Imagine Earth as a flat disk, and that's the way it looks to, you know, to ancient people. And the sky is a revolving dome where the gods live on its surface. And then there's the, the procession of the equinox over a period of almost 27,000 years. The sky moves from west to east. So that if you're waiting to, to look at a star to rise at a particular time on a particular day, eventually, over a period of maybe, what, 70 to 100 years, it will fail to rise. So if you have any culture that has gnomons where they're watching these stars, they're going to notice that. They can't not notice that. And that is why it is often credited that the procession of the equinox was discovered about 200 uh, BC, 
But in Hamlet's Mill, they argue, no, it was rediscovered. And you can read people's explanation of, uh, of the procession of the equinox and other astronomical events in myth. So we have uh, Orion as the hero. So we have Kronos, his son Zeus, his son Mercury. Uh, Mercury gives his sword to Perseus, uh, Zeus's son Apollo. There's Odin, his son Thor, his, uh, Heimdall with his golden horn, with his horse with the golden mane, uh, Gilgamesh with his stylus, which relates to how Wolf's heroes are autobiographers. And in Silk's case, is obsessed with his quill. Uh, Orion is just below the intersection of the Milky Way and the ecliptic, the path the sun takes throughout the year, passing through these constellations of the zodiac. And this is why Odin lives under the Bifrost Bridge and how he hangs from the world tree. And it's, it's why Silk lives on the intersection of Silver Street and Sun Street. According to Hamlet's Mill, it's Jesus on the cross. Orion, with his upraised arm into the ecliptic or the Milky Way, is actually turning the wheel of time. He turns the night sky, moving time forward day by day. So here's what I say happened with the story. It was once a straightforward story, fell into the hands of a series of different cultures. It was translated, giving, giving it a fairy tale feel. Then some culture where they marked astronomy, not with mathematics, but instead like our ancestors, so the authors of Amos Bill say, explaining them in the language of myth, storytelling, which is actually all the word myth means, story. They repurpose this history, maybe only a story to them or a religious text as a metaphor for the movement of the heavens. And then later, some new academic, some mythographer of a different culture and language looked at this transformed, now ancient myth and said, oh, this is a mangling of the old myth about Theseus and the Minotaur. And then that academic tried to fix the myth by tacking on the story of the black sails and Aegeus throwing himself into the sea because he assumed that that had been somehow cut off from the ending of this story. But the academic was not completely wrong because the original historical story had been converted into a story about the yearly cycles and the procession of the equinox. And as Wolf saw it, or at least liked to think of it, that's what the story of Theseus wandering the labyrinth, which the authors of Hamlet's Mill saw as the night sky, following his thread, the ecliptic, to face down the Minotaur, where Orion and the constellation Taurus face off, defeating the bull to bring the new age, the age of Taurus the bull, maybe, or the age of Ares the ram. There's room for debate there. And as the black sails of the constellation Ophiuchus rise in the east, Orion tumbles face down into the horizon, into the surrounding sea. So, because the Theseus story and the tale of student's son are designed to describe similar events, it is plausible that the death of the student at the end of the story is also parallel to real events in Severian's world, although not events that either half of Jonas was privy to. Cool. Okay. So, just to step back for other people and end it for me, because I want to, <laughs> this, this is sort of my, my teacher mode going here. Let's step back and summarize. <laughs> so, but, um, but just to be sure, everybody's fine. So part of the thing of Hamlet's Mill is that, yeah, the way we try to make sense of events in the sky and, and the way that we try to make sense of the cosmos are both storytelling. And what Hamlet's Mill is often saying is that the, the myths that we have are really trying to explain and, and put, put some structure to the way that things in the sky change. And the biggest thing um, especially for Hamlet's Mill, the biggest thing is when you have like changes of ages, right? You go from the age of Pisces to the age of right. Aquarius, for example, right? Which is when the sun is is located at a particular time of the year in the constellation Pisces or in the constellation Aries or in the constellation Leo. That becomes yep. the age. Yep. And part of the then fun of myth and and the thing that also necessarily messes it up is that one thing that happens then is that over time, all these different layers that we're talking about, the historical layer, the cosmological layer, the storytelling layer, um, the, the way that the things in the sky get connected to people and characters, those things can sometimes mess with each other. 
So like, you know, well, we have to account somehow for the fact that the sun is rising in a different uh, star system now. So how do we do that? Will we tell a different story? Or maybe we take an older story and change right, it in exactly. certain ways. So, so as what he's, what we're kind of saying is that in what Hamlet's Mill is saying, and then what Wolf's kind of picking up on here too, is that neither historical explanations nor the sort of cosmological actual events, nor even just the, the face the position of things in the sky. None of those things is necessarily the one ultimate source of, I, I don't know, call it truth mm -hmm. in any of these things, because they're all changing um, all the time. Like we're, because we are in a spinning earth and a spinning solar system and the galaxy's moving and, and, you know, our axis is changing and all of that. Our position in the cosmos is changing, but then also the stories that we're trying to tell and that historically have been told about those things, those are changing mm -hmm. too, because sometimes people get hung up on, you know, yeah, like you said, well, this story needs to have a different mm -hmm. ending because it just doesn't make sense. It's random. So we tell something else, but then that messes up how it might've been a perfect explanation of what was going on in the sky, or maybe after a certain amount of time, the way the story goes doesn't match up with what's in the sky. So you've got all these different things that changing. And when you, when you try and trace it out, you get this fun thing where almost like what's fun is that the myths are just as sort of foundational for how you understand everything as the actual cosmos. And that, that yeah, both yeah, they all call, all, they're all truths that call to a truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's hid hidden in this story. You know, Craig, you and I were recently talking about the evolution and transformation of folk songs yep. on your other podcasts. Mm -hmm. And I think this story is much like that. With it, it gathers accretions to it and they get enveloped and it. it becomes something truer to the story than maybe it, the actual original history was. Yeah. I, I think this story is much like that. But I have to believe that the original historical story, the historical in Severian's world, that is that is all there cool. if we can interpret it. Cool, cool, cool. So we'll actually start with the story. So it begins. Yeah. Uh, stop Alexa. Okay. <laughs> so Alexa just got in. <laughs> okay. Once upon the margin of the unpastured sea, there stood a city of pale towers. In it dwelt the wise. Now that city had both law and curse. The law was this, that for all who dwelt there, life held but two paths. They might rise among the wise and walk clad with hoods of myriad colors, or they must leave the city and go into the friendless world. Okay, so let's we uh, we got to pick it. We got to pick some kind of level to start with. Let, let's assume that let's take an assumption that this is a real event. Is there a, a city beside an unpastured sea that in which these events originally happened? Does that matter? Do we see anything in that at this time? I also just want to know what unpastured means. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, when I think of it, I think of it as being not, not having fences. Yeah. You know, if you mm -hmm. get from a high level, you think of all these patchwork of things. Well, no, it's all one thing. Boundless. Yeah. It's right, a cool yeah. way to, to say that it's boundless. It's borderless. Yeah. But it's also on the margin of this boundless sea, right? I, which is such a, it, it's again, a weird, weird, weird thing. It's on the border of the borderless sea. <laughs> so. so if we take this story as a, as a myth, as a Hamlet's Mill myth, a true myth, as they call it, and say, well, okay, this is a story of, of the night sky. Well, I think this becomes pretty discernible, actually. Uh, this is the, the cir circumpolar region of the sky. This, these are the stars that if you, they're close to the North or South pole and because they are close to the North and South pole, they never set beyond the horizon. And so the, the sea that it is on the verge of the unpastured sea is the, the world river that circles our, our flat disc earth and land and, or, you know, if you uh, if you want to think of it as uh, as just land or <laughs> that or they go down they go down beneath the mountains or they go down beneath the sea they go into the underworld that is what happens when a, a star sets in the sky or in the case of the procession of the equinox where when it 
fails to rise anymore at a particular time. And then we have the, the wise alchemists who go in their multicolored hoods. Uh, these are, what do alchemists do? They make gold, they make, they make um, precious metals, which is exactly what stars do in their cores. And the myriad colored hoods of the wise who remain in the city refers to the colors of the stars, white, red, orange, yellow, as the, it, the Finnish mythographers the, called the night sky, the multicolored dome. Very cool. And just to throw, like I said, my, my job here tonight is to, to throw in some other ideas too. Yeah. And to rein me in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, no, no, no. I mean, we're, <laughs> I think it's actually like one of the best parts about the Brown book is, is because it's so, I mean, these stories, even more than, you know, quote unquote poetry in general, but, but these stories are so weird that they are open to all kinds of different things. And, right, and I feel sure. like, you know, there, there are a couple things that I think are most compelling and what you're talking about is one. Um, but then the other one where is I'm always trying to look for connections to, okay, what else about these stories are things that have been connected mm -hmm. to, uh, to what we're doing. The one other thing is that when he talks about there being sort of two paths, that's kind of what we've seen Severian's world is like that you either follow the path where you go with the quote unquote wise, where you have you you wear a hood, there are hoods of many different colors, but you wear a hood. In other words, there's a kind of uniform that you wear, or you go out into the friendless world, which is chaos. And um, right now, Severian's kind of afraid because he's literally out in that chaotic world. But otherwise, where he thought he was going to go was to, you know, the world of the guild, where it seems yeah. like everything is laid out for you. So, you know, that kind of connection, there, there are certain other connections that we can find other things that have been going on so far. But that's one place where it seems like we're finding a relationship to Severian's story a little bit here. So anyway, that's the first part. And there's other things too. There's so much like, there are other ways you could talk about the city. There are other ways you could talk about like, why is the world friendless? Um, you know, it's also, it's a world where there's law and curse, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's like two, there's only two paths that you have. It's this like strict bi binary kind of thing. I mean, this is like a, uh, it's like a fable where everything feels very overdetermined. Like it seems like everything oh, yeah, yeah. has way more meaning than you can possibly understand. And you don't know which one is which, sure. which is why they're so cool, but also why a lot of people skip them because you're just like, <laughs> I just don't know what I'm supposed to be focusing on and taking out. Yeah. Anyway. Right. So, but so that we're going to, we're going to keep going. So now one there was who had studied long, all the magic known in the city, which was most of the magic known in the world. And he grew near the time at which he must choose his path in high summer when flowers with yellow and careless heads thrust even from the dark walls overlooking the sea he went to one of the wise who had shaded his face with myriad colors for longer than most could remember and for long had taught the student whose time was come and he said to him how may i even i who know nothing have a place among the wise of the city for i wish to study spells that are not sacred all my days and not go into the friendless world to dig and carry for bread. <laughs> so, yeah, so you've kind of got, first, you've got, like, another situation where you've got somebody who's like, well, like, I want to do this, but I also want to do something a little different. Like, how, how do I join you? Um, but then, like you said, I, you know, how may I, even I who don't know anything and I have questions and I'm confused of all of this, how do I fit into this world if, if I want to do things that yes. aren't exactly what you do, but I also do want to, I don't want to run off into chaos. <laughs> so. Yeah. And this idea of, well, not to die or not to go out into the, the friendless world. Uh, this is kind of a theme going, uh, going forward. Um, it's, it's something that Ball Danders is seeking. It's something that all of the Megatherians perhaps uh, were seeking to, to be, to, to avoid death simply by growing, constantly growing. Yeah. Yeah. There's also maybe a bit of Jonas in that too, whereas Jonas now is wandering around in the friendless sea as a friendless world. As that is true. And yeah. he wants to ultimately kind of get back. Like, how do I, how do I reintegrate? How do I figure out who I really am? Get back yeah. on, you know, join the community again. Exactly. Kind of yeah. yeah. Um, from a cosmological point of view, the one constellation that has remained in the circumpolar region longer than all others, despite Earth's wobble and the procession of the equinox, 
is the constellation Draco. And if we're going to assume that this is a story that is supposed to refer to the, the night sky, astronomical uh, features, then I presume that the one who he goes and talks to has remained in the city for longer than anyone else is the constellation Draco. And he also says that this whole, the drama here starts in the summer. Like that's when, when we get, is there something about that, about being in the time where there's the most, the most daylight? Well, you know, it's the, the summer solstice. So, and we're going to be following along the poles or as the ancients called them gates. And uh, so this is going to be very important. He's going to, he's going to start with the summer solstice and he's going to move to an equinox and then he's going to move to the winter solstice and then to the spring equinox. Cool. So we get a whole year. Exactly. Okay. And there's, there's a whole lot you can do with color here because there's so many different colors that are mentioned throughout the thing and the flowers and, and the yellow flowers and color, color stuff always confuses me a little bit just because there's, there's so much color. <laughs> that you can follow. Anyway, so, so to, to move on, then the old man laughed and said, do you recall how, when you were hardly more than a boy, I taught you the art by which we flesh suns from dream stuff? How skillful you were in those days, surpassing all the others. Go now and flesh such a son, and I'll show it to the hooded ones, and you will be as we. <laughs> okay. Is there something that we can make of this uh, analogy that could be applied to the real world in Severian's case? So making someone from dream stuff? Um, I have struggled with this. I have struggled with this for a long, long time. I, I, do, I have other things to say about it, but not that. The one thing I think, it, and I don't want to say this is a giveaway because it's still, it's still very esoteric, but I, I actually do have a sense that one of the things that, that Wolf really insists on, honestly, in everything he writes, is that stories give meaning, that, that stories don't just like point out meaning that's already there, but that, that in some ways Wolf is kind of like the world doesn't have any meaning until someone makes a story. And then this is where I think Wolf is different from what people would normally think. Cause normally that would sound almost kind of relativistic or postmodern that it's not until you tell a story or have a narrative that anything makes sense. Um, but again, and otherwise it's chaos, but I actually think that Wolf kind of says that the stories actually create the truth and that the truth really is there. I mean, I've talked before about how, there's there's a weird way I feel like to read Book of the New Sun, which is that it starts off as a sort of world without God. And by the end of it, it's actually because of the storytelling and because of the belief it's created a God in the world, which seems totally backwards. <laughs> but I but I feel like there is something that's kind of that way. So this idea of you create flesh from dreams, like that's mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about, that there is this this idea here that once you really understand the story, you can make something out of nothing. Um, yeah. And I feel like that's, to me, that's always been central to Wolf. And, and I know that's probably minority opinion, <laughs> but uh, because it's really hard to square that with sort of being an <laughs> Orthodox Catholic, but um, nonetheless, uh, I feel like that idea comes up over and over in his, in his stuff. <laughs> so you've got that right here. Um, what does that mean? It feels like to me, it's very much also the idea of Severian having to, leave the sort of world where he was brought up where everything is structured by the rituals of the guild go off into the world sort of have a crisis of faith where he doesn't believe what people told him and then either find the truth or make the truth again for him and he's got to figure out you know what he thinks is important and of course he becomes the new autark he becomes yeah. the new central leader and apparently recreates all kinds of things in the world in different images so there is a bit of that that's that's really a grand meaning to get from <laughs> from go create a student or a son out of dreams but but i still feel like it's there <laughs> well i yeah i say i say i've never been able to come up with a mundane uh explanation of what's going on at this point however um to beat another dead horse uh the discovery of the importance and the centrality of the first severian and our Severian has led to kind of a, I can't put my finger on, on, on it, how it works one-to-one, -one, but the student and his son, who is a, a student he's made from, from, from his own dreams, from his own imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That, that, 
I'm afraid that really does carry a lot for me at this point. It works. It works with, it definitely works with first Severian. Yeah. Of sort of, you know, I will create a me that's better <laughs> or, or, or does something different. Yeah. Also I'm, I'm working on the, uh, the skeleton for our next Patreon story, which is circular ruins by Jorge Luis Borges. And that is a story to spoil another story about a man. He comes, he wanders away from wars in the past, from a murky past. And he comes to some circular ruins and he lays down there to go to sleep. And he dreams of a youth. And each night he dreams the youth and he becomes more clear and more clear and more clear. And then one day there he is sitting there when he wakes up and he teaches him. And then he's eventually he's taught him everything he can teach him and he sends him on down the river to a next set of ruins upon which he discovers that he himself is formed from dreams, from someone else's dreams. And that is an endless cycle going on. And I think that has to be something that Wolf is, is pinging on right here. You have the circuit, you have the Citadel, yeah. this, this, this city, he's in a circular ruins. Um, I think Wolf definitely had the idea of the circumpolar region, which is a big circle around the, the North pole in his mind. And so these, how these, these ideas have kind of, kind of gone, come together and merged yeah. into one. Yeah. And there's also, there's a much more sort of mundane way to think about this too, but this is also Wolf was never afraid to put in sort of allegories of the writer's life in everything. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, doing. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, what is making a son, if not creating characters out of your dreams, right? True. Like to go make a character like this, it's like saying, you know, I want to live. And of course, you know, a really good writer does make something out of nothing. Yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> what we have. I mean, of course it's not, dreams are not nothing, right? There's history and other people you've read and everything mm -hmm. that goes into it. Wanna, um, so yeah, so, but still there is very much that kind of writer allegory of this. And I like too the fact that the student's saying, hey, can I wait a bit? I'm not ready yet, right? There's, there's also the sense that he knows how serious this is, but I just need more time. Anybody right? who writes for a living understands this situation. Yeah. Oh, right. I don't think we read that line, but it's there. <laughs> but the student said another season, let pass another season and I'll do everything you advise. Right. Yeah, exactly. So he's, yeah. he's procrastinating. Yeah. He's putting, we it are off. such he's terrible procrastinators. I, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not a creative writer, but I do write for a living. If you want to be a writer, by the way, um, and you're, and you want something that'll be lucrative, uh, being a technical writer is the most lucrative form of writing professionally that you can do. Um, it's, not as uh, eternally rewarding as creative writing. So I'm not necessarily recommending that to anyone, but um, it, it's, it's the same life. I'm always saying, oh, maybe, you know, I could make this a little bit better if I, <laughs> if you would just give me more time. This is also, this is also totally true of how academics treat their thesis. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like saying, oh, well, I just need to research just a little bit more. Then I'll write that chapter. Yeah. Why, why, why are writers such terrible procrastinators? We are. I mean, I, I sit there and I have, I figured it out and I've mapped it out. So I have plenty of time to finish, which allows me to go get another cup of tea. And next thing you know, I find myself with, you know, a week left <laughs> before I have to deliver this. Yeah. I often feel like the, for me, it's, it's often that feeling of having to, to be a funnel that you just got all this stuff that you're trying to juggle in your head. Um, and that you're going to eventually juggle in the words and whatnot. And you've got to get it out in linear sentences yeah. and like one by one, I think of it like a funnel. And part of the problem of the thinking that goes in before the writing is a good analogy is like just making sure to try and line up everything so that it actually does get out into the funnel <laughs> like like yeah. it, I, there's all that stuff that you're trying to get through one little tiny hole and you can't just force it or else it all just blocks yeah. so it's it's more a matter of maneuvering stuff beforehand and what are you prioritizing and what are you thinking about and, and all that kind of stuff whereas even and yet you come to the you come to the deadline and fear is a great organizing principle right there so yep yep no, no, I get it. If I could do that, 
I mean, I've, I've learned that myself and that's, but one reason, like, honestly, so one reason why I'm often better doing stuff at night and I'm absolutely a night owl more than the day is just that for some reason in the day, I've always felt like there, there's too much possibility in the day. Whereas at night, everything, everything mm, sort of yeah. focuses, everything gets closer and it's easier yeah. to do that. So ties into that funnel metaphor somehow or another. Um, oh, let's see. What else do I say? Uh, let's see. The constellation Draco. Uh, Draco means uh, the serpent. And uh, it was originally imagined by the Chaldeans with claws and wings. So a genuine dragon. Or perhaps the Inhumi of Wolf's uh, super novel, The Book of the Long Sun, The Book of the Short Sun. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, even in Wizard Knight, the dragon is from yeah, the lowest yeah, absolutely, realm. Yeah. So we're already going to have some time pass. So the next part, autumn came. Yes. Here we are at the... Uh, Fall semester. <laughs> the equinox, right? Yep. The autumnal equinox. Yep. So autumn came and the sycamores of the city of pale towers that were sheltered from the sea winds by its high wall dropped leaves like the gold manufactured by their owners. And the wild salt geese streamed among the pale towers and after them, the ossifrage and the lammer gear. <laughs> okay. Now, a salt goose is a food. It's not a bird, uh, you know, like a mm -hmm. salt pork. But uh, salt geese, gray in color, are, are apparently quite common in Severian's earth. The uh, lammer gear is a bearded vulture. Uh, an ossifrage is an eagle, sometimes also a bearded vulture. Uh, so these birds, we've seen these uh, these trios of birds before once in Severian's um, mausoleum when he's looking out and then a then when they're leaving Nessus when they come to the curtain wall and that's because in a cosmological sense all these places are the same place they are the the northern circumpolar region which Orion Severian with his sword is a, a, an Orion character uh, reaches up into that uh, that circumpolar region right at the edge uh, where the, the sun passes and where it intersects with the Milky Way. So uh, the Lamagir, um, well, let's take these in order. The, the, these birds are constellations. Uh, Aquila, the eagle, Lyra, which was called by the Romans, the diving vulture. And then there's Cygnus, the swan of the subfamily, and Syrie, meaning geese. And these three constellations are often identified with the Stymphalian birds of, of Hercules' labors. Do they go in that order too? Do the constellations move in that order? I'm trying to think. I have to look back, but I think Wolf kind of moves them around. The point uh, being that they're there. The reason I asked was just because he emphasizes a couple. He emphasizes a couple times in the story that the order of the birds, like the, this bird, was followed by these other birds. We mm -hmm. them. Yeah, so, yeah. So there's definitely that that sense of them being there. So, well, yeah, I will remember that back when they're leaving Nessus and they're headed for the Piteus Gate. Uh, in Severian speculation, the eagle and the great mountain Teratornus, a, a, a giant vulture-like bird of prey, and possibly, he says, the wild geese and their allies. So Severian, in his mausoleum, uh, he, he sees a storm crow build a nest not two cubits from his face, which is uh, Aquila, uh, and then the a hawk spreading its wings at the top of a pine, which is Cygnus, and a caracara, coursing a viper, Lyra, orbiting the circumpolar Draco, and there's also a fox uh, stalking its prey, which is Vulpecula, the fox. All these are located in roughly the same area of the sky. One other thing I think is cool from a slightly different perspective, just because, um, and I, I like... Nobody else can see your notes, but I love how on your notes you have ossifrage. It's a lammer gear. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, it's just the same thing. Um, but what's cool about that is this is also possibly one of those places where Wolf could be kind of making some weird joke about what translation is like, because you know, we already know that he's saying that all these sort of archaic words are just the closest approximations that we can mm -hmm. get of something else. But even if you think of the Brown book, then of itself being some book that's gone through translation after translation after translation, um, the fact that we just have different words for what might be the same bird, um, that's 
but it's but they seem so different and it seems like he's insisting on they go in this order and one always follows the other but when you try and figure out what they are that it's possible they may just mm -hmm. be the same birds and so there's no real way to understand well, what does that mean it seems like you're it's so significant because you're pointing it out and he mentions this a few times but there literally may be no way to understand it and that's where wolf is kind of playing with that thing about like i'm gonna write something that makes it seem like it's full of meaning but there's actually no way to yeah yeah out it, it, and that that creates such that weird i mean i think that's very much that kind of thing that attracts so many people to wolf anyway in the first part is you're you're in this place that seems like everything is suffused with so much meaning but you have no way to figure it out <laughs> that's why people fell in love with bob dylan right yeah Oh yeah, and then the yeah. and and then the Beatles wrote uh, "I am the the Eggman, I am the Walrus," and because they felt like Dylan had been getting away with murder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but there is a bit of that, I think, here. Or you could you could this is a definitely a good place to to see exactly kind of how how Wolf tries to pull that off. So we're in autumn, and the old man calls for the student. He says, "Then the old man sent again for him who had been his student." And said, now surely you must flesh for yourself a creation of dream as I have instructed you. For the others among the hooded ones grow impatient. Save for us, you are the eldest in the city. And it may be that if you do not act now, they will turn you out by winter. <laughs> but the student answered, I must study further that I may achieve what I seek. Can you not for one season protect me? And the old man who had taught him thought of the beauty of the trees that had for so many years delighted his eyes like the limbs of women. And the one thing I like is that the old man gives him time because he thought of trees that had lasted so long and, you know, and that just seeing the pleasure of these things that were old and that had been able to just last and just endure gave him pleasure. And so he's, it's, it, He's coming to pressure the kid into saying, you have to achieve, you have to grow, you have to do something else. But then he sits back and thinks about how much pleasure he's gotten from watching things that change super, yeah. super slowly. And um, I, I do get the sense of that, those two different times really being important there, like the urge to do something now versus the pleasure you get from something that's given you pleasure for many, many years is being in some kind of contract. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like that interpretation. As far as what it means in a larger sense, I don't know. Otherwise, I don't really have, I don't know what to say about that. There's got to be something. Let's get through I, winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We try to tear everything apart and it's going to take forever. So it's already going to take a long time. So at length, the golden autumn wore away and winter came stalking into the land from his frozen capital where the sun rolls along the edge of the world like a trumpery gilded ball and the fires that flow between the stars and earth kindle the sky. Yeah, that's talking about, you know, sun doesn't rise very high so it's rolls around on the edge of the of the horizon yeah it skirts along the edge his touch turned the waves to steel and the city of the magicians welcomed him hanging banners of ice from its balconies and heaping its roof with glaces of snow the old man summoned his student again and the student answered as before there's no sense of even talking about it. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's winter time. Get it over with. Oh, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. You've got more time. But just to think about the cosmological thing here, here treating the sun as something that you greet and that has its own thing, but then you try and, and you know, all these sort of weather events that happen are actually the ways that you, you greet the sun or grace the sun. I mean, humanizing or personifying the sun is obviously something that's important in the rest of the book. And here we have this one bit immediately doing that. And every way that we're talking about the sun, it's giving things power. It's like, you know, his touch turned the waves to steel. So this whole section is personifying cosmological things, winter and the sun. And that's obviously something that the rest of the books are going to do right with the sun being a savior figure. But I like too how everything here is about uh, the idea, for example, that wind that winter turns waves to steel, and that the the magicians welcomed winter by sort of hanging ice banners like icicles. But mm -hmm. it's such a cool way of turning all these just sort of quote unquote natural objects into a story by just describing mm -hmm. them in different ways. Yeah, yeah, this is a beautiful way to describe winter, yeah, and right? it's so cool. But it's also very much an exact kind of analogy to what we're talking about with how myths can 
sort of give reason, stories can give reason to things that might seem chaotic in other ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's so cool and it can seem like it's sort of just decoration or just sort of frivolous ways to talk about, to describe things, but it actually lets you feel like there's some kind of reason or control or some intentionality to what's going on in the world. Um, Oh, look at and think about look at the way he describes the aurora borealis. The fires that flow between the stars and earth kindle the sky. Yeah, it's so cool. So yeah, yeah so he doesn't. We don't even get the conversation. It's just so so nothing. So spring came, and with it gladness to all nature. But at spring, the city was hung with black. And by the way, this I would live in this city. This <laughs> And hatred and the loathing of one's own powers that eats like a worm at the heart, a phrase we've heard before, fell on the magicians. For the city had but one law and one curse. And though the law held sway all the year, the curse ruled the spring. In spring, the most beautiful maidens of the city, the daughters of the magicians, were clothed in green. And while the soft winds of spring teased their golden hair, they walked unshod through the portal of the city and down the narrow path that led to the quay and boarded the black-sailed ship that waited them. And because of their golden hair and their gowns of green fail, and because it seemed to the magicians that they were reaped like grain, they were called the corn maidens. <laughs> uh, now, a corn maiden is a pan-cultural icon from Turkey, Poland, Scotland, even Native American. But here, I think, here in the green and gold colors, they are the Milky Way, a glorious path encircling our world in the celestial sphere, like the Midgard serpent. It stretches from the circumpolar region to the horizon, which is, of course, as I said, the unpastured sea of the magician city. In the northern hemisphere in the spring, at sunset, it extends past Orion to the western horizon, where it lies at the ogre's island in the West. And the enslavement of the corn maidens means that the student makes his son after the end of the golden age, when the Milky Way and the ecliptic have fallen from their proper positions. And the quest of the hero is to return the sky to that golden age. Right. So I was going to say, if the corn maidens are the Milky Way, then since that's this really sets off the whole drama of the rest of the book. Yeah, it's a fight over returning the gold, the corn maidens. And um, we're going to find out in the end that they all don't exactly return in the perfect way, that there are going to be lots of right. changes that happen. Um, but we do get a new kind of order that's come back to things. Yeah. So so right, yeah. one other thing we got to mention is that eventually – uh, this is going to start leading into the very details of the Theseus myth. Athens had to send some young women, seven, usually consider seven young women, sometimes seven women, some seven men, um, to Crete as a kind of, of offering or show of loyalty. And eventually Theseus is going to say, no, send me instead. Um, and of course, in our version, he's going to go right. try and get him back. Yes, they go with it, but they're, but you know they're he's just basically a, a trail of uh, of corn maidens, right? Right, right. And notice too that here we've got this thing that it seems just associated with spring, right? The story doesn't tell us why this has to happen. It also starts to starts to literally not make a whole lot of sense because if every year they send their daughters. <laughs> Out in spring, how could they send yeah, all these yeah. young women out? Wouldn't they have had to do it last year? So, yeah. So this is where it's obvious that the the sort of straightforward logic is not working. And we're more in a kind of dream logic right. in a lot of ways. For or myth right. logic, because myth also has a lot of, um, or, yeah. of motivations that don't make real sense when you, when you think about them. Because right. that's not their purpose. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And that's that's what makes it so hard to, to figure these out or even to treat them like something that you could decode because there's not going to be one-to-one -one things. The logic of things changes as the story right. goes on too. So yeah, but anyway, this is the first big sort of connection to Theseus that we're going to get. Then the last, then the last paragraph it says, when the man who had long been the student of the old man, but was yet unhooded, heard the dirges and laments, and looking from his window, saw the maidens filing by. He set aside all his books 
and began to draw such figures as no man had ever seen, and to write in many languages as his master had taught him aforetime. Ah, the writer is finally inspired. Exactly. And, and how does how is a, a male writer typically inspired seeing beautiful young women? Beautiful women. And the motivation is weird. Like, is he doing it because he feels like he has to do something about this horrible thing? Is he is he like you said? Is it more of an inspiration? Is that is they were his muse or something like that? I mean, we don't we don't really know. We just know that he stops procrastinating and decides to start. Working. Right. Exactly. That one does seem like there ought to be some sort of cosmological. <laughs> what what is it about finally recognizing? Well, I th- no, I, I really do think that this is th- th- this is Wolf creating a metaphor of the writer once again. He looks at the it, it, perhaps it's the tragedy of the corn maidens or it's their beauty. Either way, he's finally inspired and he can finally put it all together. You stop studying and just start putting it down onto the page. If you really want to push it specifically for Wolf, maybe it's finally seeing the Milky Way and seeing the whole large river of the sky at once. And <laughs> the cosmological thing gets in. Well, what could be more? If you ever see the Milky Way, man, it, you can, it, you will be inspired. I know. So. It's been so many years since I was out in north of Santa Fe and just out in the mountains and cold clear winter night and i could see everything so beautifully oh, i miss it right all right but that's the end of part one so obviously we're in strange myth world right where logic is <laughs> right. not working exactly as we want to but we're also what's special i think here another thing to point out the whole first section tells the story of a year and of that yearly cycle and then ends with something that like james said is seems very 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 traditionally to be some kind of uh, image of the Milky way. Mm -hmm. All of that to me is some of the stuff that really made me when I first read your stuff, start to to pay attention that it's like, you get this little, this little summary here of, you know, this is about the, the passage of a year and, and all these things are sort of getting really active when you start thinking about the sky. So so let's go ahead. the next one. Yeah. So let's let's do right. just in case because that's an hour. <laughs> Hold on. Let's, Is it really? Yep. Should we stop? End of part one. Uh, yeah. Let, let's let's. And one nice thing about it, if we do it, if we do part one and two, we get over the the setup and we we start yeah. for the action. Yeah. Part two, the fleshing of the hero. Day after day he labored. When the first light came at the window, his pen had been a drudge already many hours. And when the moon tangled her crooked back among the pale towers, his lamp shone bright. At first it seemed to him that all the skill his master had taught him of old had deserted him, for from the first light to the moonlight he was alone in his chambers, save for the moth that fluttered sometimes to show the insignia of death at his undaunted candle flame. (laughs) Which I think is... Probably supposed to be one of the Silence in the Lambs moths, right? Like death's head moth. <laughs> I would think. Is that what are you saying? It's that's what I was. That's what I was thinking. That meant there, like one of those moths with a death head. Uh, perhaps once again, this is a a writer's metaphor of seeking immortality through one's work, right? Yeah, yeah. And all this work that you you work and work, and nothing really seems to come of it. And um, but I do like a couple little things that the moon tangled her crooked back among the pale towers mm-hmm. That's oh yeah cool yeah that you know she rises and goes down and and gets lost in all this different stuff um yeah and then of course goes through the crisis of faith of like you know whenever anyone's writing anything everybody will hit that moment of my god i'm an <laughs> idiot and i have no idea what i'm doing and this is going to be the worst thing ever but yeah and and the thing there about for he was alone in his chambers is because apparently Fleshing your dreams means that all of a sudden you're going to have something there. There's going to be a real person. And the one thing I think is kind of cool about that with writing is you never, it's almost that, that thing of it's just all of a sudden you're going to have created something that is itself there and you're never quite sure exactly when it's been successful or not. That's, I mean, eventually he's going to have created his son and his son comes and talks to him. But that idea that you never know quite when you've achieved the thing you're trying to do when you write, I mean, that, That works too. There've been a few times when I've really felt like, ah, I've got it now and I've got it done. But a lot of the times it'll be like when I come back and read something the next day, I'll be like, oh, there's the idea. But, but when I was doing it, I didn't actually know it was 
I had figured it out yet. So I, I love that idea that, that in the middle of things, you're not exactly sure, um, how it is. And that also works for, I think so much about life. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, you, you never know exactly what the most important things, what the most important moments are a lot of the right. time when you're doing things. Then there crept into his dreams when sometimes he nodded over the table, another, and he knowing who that other was welcomed him though the dreams were fleeting and soon forgotten. He labored on, and that which he strove to create gathered about him as smoke collects about the new fuel thrown upon a fire almost dead. At times, and particularly when he worked early or late, and when having at long last laid aside all the implements of his art, he stretched himself at length upon the narrow bed provided for those who had not yet earned the many-colored hood, he heard the step, always in another room, of the man he hoped to call into life. So all this good stuff about writing and about how it works and, and how it works in dreams and when you're not actually working. I mean, this is probably true of all kinds of creative stuff, you know, that the, so much of it happens subconsciously and unconscious. But I also, I didn't know about the narrow bed. Did you have any significance to that? <laughs> That's such a... Yeah, this scene always reminds me of Severian after his elevation in his little cell yeah. on the narrow bed. And he hears outside the footsteps, uh, which also include the pad of a little dog's feet. Yeah. And it is Malrubius out there, uh, which, you know, uh, interesting, but, you know, what does it mean? And now it means, now that I believe that Malrubius is the first Severian, this scene means a lot more to me. I like that too, just to, to be that kind of weird echo to some specific thing that had happened in Severian's story. Yeah. Cause otherwise mm -hmm. Severian is not trying to write something. He's not creating anything. At least he doesn't think he is. Exactly. Right yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I like that. In time, these manifestations originally rare and indeed at first limited almost entirely to those nights when thunder rumbled among the pale towers became common and there were unmistakable signs of the other's presence. A book he'd not unshelved in decades lying beside a chair. Windows and doors that unlocked, as it seemed of themselves. An ancient Alphonse, for years past an ornament hardly more deadly than a trompe l'oeil picture, found cleansed of its patina, gleaming and newly sharp. We should probably say Okay, so, yeah, yeah, trompe l'oeil uh, picture. Uh, we, those are actually going to be, uh, Severian's going to actually discover these in the house absolute yeah. uh, it's, it's a picture just just looks so real right and in, in his case he he can't tell whether he can walk into that picture or it's just a picture yep. or like painted columns on the side of doors or something like that like you've seen i see an, an alfange or an alfange uh orion is the template for all curved blade wielding severers of myth like Kronos with his sickle, severing the connection between heaven and earth with his black curved scythe, and uh, Hermes severing the neck of starry-eyed Argos with his uh, curved sword, and Perseus severing the neck of the Gorgon. Um, both Hermes and uh, Perseus both carried Alphonsus, which is a curved blade that uh, with the blade on the inside of that curved. Um, also, the hunter, King Peleus, the father of Achilles, had his divinely blessed curved sword that could cut through anything. So, you know, it's it's no surprise that one of the evidences that the student's son, this hero, will imminently emerge is a restored alphange, a curved, sometimes subtly curved blade with a sharpened inner edge. And also think of the things that are kind of associated with him. we got a weapon and a book, right? you got... Um, also thinking right. of how, I don't know, history or whatever goes into writing, you have both very, very, very viscerally, viscerally experienced things, but also other writing that goes into that. So you've got both those aspects. Oh, also, um, Latris Blade uh, in Soldier of the Mist, Falcata, also a curved sword with an inner edge. Oh, is it the inner edge? Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, he he names it uh, because of its uh, it, the, the word actually comes because it looks like a sickle. Oh wow! Okay, I think I had forgotten that. 
but I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but it's been, yeah. it's been a long time since I've read Lecter. Uh, Severian's, well, Severian's blade is not curved, but he carries a gem that in a symbolic sense is directly associated with his sword. And that gem is a claw. Yeah, that's true. That is very true. Cool. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So the, the, the hero's going to bear that uh, Alphonse when he uh, sails against the ogre. The thunder, I don't really know quite what to make of the the why he's more creative or why these manifestations come more when the thunder comes, unless that's just, they, they come more at times of drama instead of... Yeah, well, when else would something like this happen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's when the books fall off is when the, the towers right. rattle and whatnot. But, and one other thing too, notice how different time passes in this section as opposed to the first section. The first section was very much told like a fable, right? Like it was spring and he came to him and said, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But as now we're getting more like, okay, the nights are passing and we're, right, just we're in focusing in. And, this is yeah. one event. He's finally starting to write. Yeah. yeah. So, which is also indicative of how this is a story that's mixed up of a whole bunch of other stories. It seems like to me, like they're each section almost has a different narrator. It's almost like, like trying to put the Cimmerillion and the Hobbit in one book and trying to say that they're the same thing. <laughs> like they, they <laughs> wouldn't seem like it, uh, even, even if they are in some ways, you know, they're, right. they're very different. So, but okay. So finally he says one golden afternoon when the wind played the innocent games of childhood with the, fresh fledged sycamores, there came a knock at the door of his study. Not daring to turn or express even the smallest part of what he felt by his voice, or even to desist from work, he called enter. Yeah. As doors open at midnight, though no living thing stirs, the door began a thread's width at a time to swing back. Yet as it moved, it seemed to gather strength so that when it was open, as he judged by the sound, enough that a hand might have been thrust into the room, it seemed that the playful breeze had come in by the window to push life into its wooden heart. And when it was open, as he judged again wider still, so much so that a diffident helot might have entered with a tray, it seemed a very sea storm seized it and flung it back against the wall. Then he heard strides behind him, quick and resolute, and a voice respectful and youthful, yet deep with a cleanly manhood, addressed him, saying, Father? I little like to vex you when you are deep in your art, but my heart is sorely troubled and has been so these several days, and I beg you by the love you have for me to suffer my intrusion and counsel me in my difficulties. Ah, there you go. He's he's literally fleshed a son. Yeah. Not just someone who has suddenly woken up and said, where am I, where am I? But a son who knows his father. Yeah. Right? Yep. And already interestingly enough, seems to have wills and desires of his own, right? So, yeah. so we've given rise to something which is already different and already not at all like a dependent child, but something that's very different. Just a couple little things. It starts off and because we're going to get Ariadne and the thread through the labyrinth, the, that's at least in the story. The fact that he talks about a thread here, you know, a thread's width at a time. That just mm-hmm. stands out as a, a detail, but it's also totally out of place, right? It has nothing to do right, with yeah. that, which again is sort of that 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 weird craziness of seemingly significant, but not in a way you can quite piece together. Um, also, all this time describing the door and and the movement of the door. Oh, so much tension in here. Yeah, really. I mean, like like um, uh, like like a ghost story. Very much like a ghost story. Yeah. He's at the he's, he's at the bottom of the stairs. He's at the door. Yeah. You know? And and here, what's what's it going to be? It feels like it's just a breeze. Oh no, no, maybe it's not. And then oh, I hear steps, and it's not until that moment that the youth has become real. Yeah, yeah. And and again, one of those moments that seems so fraught with meaning, and maybe it is just a way to build tension up to this moment. But at the same time, all these images that he sees about, you know, a helot coming to his door or, you know, a hand pushing through um, and the door having life of its own. There's all this stuff that I just don't, it, it doesn't mean things in the way that a fable or a myth would normally mean, right? It's just, if we're just talking about why does, what, what does Wolf the Rider do to make these stories, to me at least, seem so strange, but also compelling at the same time? It's it's doing just that. Like, right. it does build a lot of tension, but I have no idea what each of those little images 
is supposed to mean. No, no, it's a feel. It's a we're going for a feel for it. Not right? it's, it's yeah. not oh, yeah. in any individual point of this part. So, well, why? Okay, in order to not be cast out of the city, you've got to flesh a student, a son from yeah. dreams. Yeah. Really? <laughs> That's no. Okay, so in order to flesh a son from dreams, he sits up late at night writing. <laughs> How's that? How does that work? There's, there's no way to literally make that work. It's, yeah. it's yeah. all metaphor. It's so cool too. But I, it, I totally, I think everybody totally gets why you skip these, right? Because you're like, okay, but, but Jonas, variant, <laughs> 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 and then there's all this stuff. But it's so cool. So, um, okay, well, we'll finish. We'll keep going. Then the student dared turn himself where he sat, and he saw standing before him a youth, haughty of port, wide of shoulder and mighty of thew. <laughs> we can, should we, should we explain those? Those are such, um, you know, Robert Howard descriptions, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's totally, totally corny. <laughs> but haughty of port. Well, of course it's the left-hand side of the, of the ship, but that's not. Even using the word port there is a little bit like finding odd Words like I had to look it up, but no, here it means more like port, like comportment, like how you comport yourself. And it's more just your sort of general physical manner um, in your bearing, that kind of thing. So, but it's, it's again, a cool way where we know we're going to get a whole ship sailing story here in a little bit. And so port would initially mean, seem to mean something different, but yeah, it just means his general bearing. Uh, oh, wide of shoulder. We got that. That's, that's good. That's good Conan is there. Um, but then Mighty of Thu. Yeah, that's your that's your that's your, your your muscular strength. So he's a he's he's not only kind of uh kind of a proud, confident uh, way of carrying himself, he's not only just flat out good looking, he's also a very strong man. Yeah. And I I didn't know this, but I like how um the Merriam-Webster online dictionary says it used to often be bundled up with with the thews and sinews, um, especially after the 16th century. But if, even with all my grad school reading, I don't remember ever seeing thew before. Oh, and, yeah. Well, if you've read Conan, surely you've seen her. I, I must have, but I just I blanked yeah. on it. So I'm saying yeah. that now, and it's probably in some like famous Shakespeare thing. That I, oh, wait. wait let, I want to look at the free dictionary where they have a citation. That would be cool. The American. Nope. 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 Never mind. Command was in his firm mouth, knowing wit in his bright eyes and courage in all his face. Upon his brow sat that crown that is invisible to every eye, but can be seen even by the blind. The crown beyond price that draws brave men to a paladin and makes weak men brave. Then the student said, well, let's, let's, let's oh, go on with that oh, yeah. because that oh. is something that Wolf sort of alludes to in the book of the long sun. Because that is a special ability that Silk is is born with, yeah. which is the the power of, of authority, the power of command, the sort of special something that causes people to want to follow you. Yeah. Right. And yeah. we all know who's got it, even if we don't like them, even if we hate them. Yep. And we and you can't fake it. Yep. And it's, it's one of those, it's a good intangible, but, but it seems yeah. like we all know people who have it. And right. yeah, like you said, it can be frustrating or it's the kind of people who, you know, just have a certain weird unnamed confidence that just lets them do things that they shouldn't be able to do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but here specifically, I think that, yeah, it's more about that authority and, and yeah. command and that, that leadership thing. And Wolf is very much uh, a believer in that kind of thing. But also um, when I, when I read this, since having read Hamlet's Mill, I always think of the, this term that they would use for the house or the, the constellation that held the sun on special days. You might move to another constellation. You might, you know, whoever the, the hero or the god of, of that ritual who has changed forms because you've, You've had to call new stars, but it, they still carry that special crown of command. Yeah, I like that. And that absolutely seems like what we're giving birth to here. Right. Like that's really, all, it's the last of the big significant characteristics that the sun has. And that's really, really in the end, 
the most important thing. All his physical characteristics, you know, even if he does look like Conan, right? That's not what does it. It's ultimately this crown, <laughs> crown beyond price. Not exactly a pearl of great price, but but I don't know. That phrase to me, I feel like, is supposed to remind you beyond price, pearl of great price. It's I don't know. To me, it echoes of that, but it's not quite the same thing. So, but yeah, draws brave men to a paladin. I was trying to think one thing, D and D paladins don't really have, uh, <laughs> they, they don't, well, they, no, they do have to have charisma. That's right. They've got to have, you've yeah. got to have a high charisma stat. In them. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. If, if you don't, then every, it, then you're just a warrior. It affects how everyone yeah. deals with you. I already explained that one of the ways a star can avoid sinking below the horizon, going into the friendless world is by being a circumpolar star. There's another way, a star or constellation that is setting nightly, yearly, or processionally can become a Janus, a two-faced god of doorways, heralding a new year or a new age at the passing of the glory, the Havarna per Hamlet's Mill, to a new set of stars at the beginning of a new sun cycle. And that way, he can be the dying year or age, as well as the new one. He can become the old man and the youth the giant and the giant killer, the mother and the maiden, the father and the son. He can be the supplanter and the supplanted. If you see a connection to the fifth head of Cerberus here, you should. Uh, the destroyer and the destroyed, uh, like um, Kronos and his son Zeus. Kronos is overthrown. Zeus takes his place, but it's the same crown. It's the same glory. It's just a different character. They're essentially the same. They are, in a truest sense, the same person. His son or heir or overthrower can carry on while he himself falls beyond the horizon into the underworld. The true flying Dutchman, or as in the, the Counting Cats in Zanzibar story by Gene Wolfe, the fleeing woman, the protagonist says, do you know why there's always a flying Dutchman, a vessel that never reaches port or sinks? I mean, the legend, it's because if you put an end to it, throw holy water into the sea or whatever, you become the new Dutchman, you, yourself. <laughs> so, you know, we, we see this, this principle demonstrated in the Book of the Long Sun, where blood kills Tussa, then, who's the Calde, and then takes over his house. And then later, Silk, the son of Tussa, kills blood and takes over the house and the Calde ship. Uh, fifth head of Cerberus, like I said, each clone kills his father and becomes the new father, who is also, in a sense, the old father. Uh, VRT murders Marsh in order to become him. It, it's why the Autark candidate, Severian, has to slay the previous Autark in order to become the new Autark, and in a sense, become that Autark and every previous one as well. Uh, there's other examples, too numerous to mention here. But it also, I think, goes a little way to explaining why we don't have a master and a student and that tells the story. We have a student who's already learning from something else and trying to create something. And then he has a son. Right. And the son then is the one who has to, to go on, have this horrible, you know, horrible adventure. Um, but then he doesn't come back to save his father. His father's yeah. dead. At the but end. he's, yeah, he's, so maybe, and he's made from the father's dream stuff. He's a, in a sense, yeah. the father himself. Yeah. I just like that idea that there's no fundamental origin, that it's always somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Like it's always in the process of being made. And I don't know exactly what to make of that, but well, actually I do think I know what I make of it, but <laughs> we'll get there. I think it gets back to my thing about stories give rise to truth, mm -hmm. um, which seems backwards, but it's actually always a process. So then the student said, my son, have no fear of disturbing me now or ever. For there's nothing under heaven that I should rather see than your face. What is it that <laughs> troubles you? Yeah. Now they already have a father-son relationship. It's, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Father, the young man said, every night for many nights, my sleep has been rent with the screams of women. And often I've seen like a green serpent called by the notes of a pipe, a column of green slip down the cliff below our city to the quay. And sometimes it's vouchsafed me in my dream to go near and then I see that all who walk in that column are fair women, and that they weep and scream and stagger as they walk, so that I might think of them a field of young grain beaten by a moaning wind. What is the meaning of this dream? Well, I'll tell you one thing it's the meaning of. It's no surprise that the corn maidens should trouble the young man's dream, because the Milky Way actually passes 
right through the head of Orion. That's a fun, that's very fun. <laughs> that, that's a really <laughs> cool detail. Yep. And I like too, that we're getting the sun having dreams. Like it's the sun who sees things that he doesn't quite understand. Like it's the creature of dreams who comes to the, the father in this case. And he's like, help me understand my dreams. What is, what does this mean? So it's, you get a bit of a, a, a different mm -hmm. version there. Oh, the um, oh, and the green serpent. So we do get a moment here of uh, a reference to the serpent, which to me seems like a strange way to describe mm -hmm. the women. Like usually, and this is just sort of my my normal thing of snakes are supposed to be bad, <laughs> but <laughs> but here it's not. It's a it's it's a, a serpent that is actually something that's sad and that you want to help. Yeah, well, it's not for nothing that I mentioned the and compared the Milky Way to the Midgard Serpent. That's right. That's right. So, my son, said the student, the time has come when I must tell you what I have concealed from you until now, fearing that in the rashness of your youth, you might dare too much before the time was ripe. And, okay, so, like, what has he concealed from him? He's like, I had never talked to him before, <laughs> right? So, so now we're, <laughs> we're back into... Well, as he made him, well, as he made him, he has not told yep, him this. That's true. But so now we find out. So know that this city is oppressed by an ogre who each year demands of its fairest daughters, even as you have seen in your dream. Now, again, we haven't heard of the ogre at all, right? right. We, it seems before like this, this city was, was great. There was a law and a curse, but now we find out a little bit more about what the curse was. But I also think Wolf is probably intentionally doing this in a way that you could imagine that the first section was written in a world and a time where there was no story of the ogre. And yet now it's being sort of attached to another bit of a story where now we've got the ogre story. So where, I mean, it might be that each of these different parts, like for me, it's, it's useful to imagine it as each different part was actually some maybe different version of a myth or different stories that over time got woven together. And I mean, there are plenty of, medieval manuscripts and even old um like apocryphal apocryphal stories of the bible where apocryphal stories of mm -hmm. like things that didn't make it into the bible like that were there were copies of copies of summaries of of other you know gospels or stories of saints or things like that where by the time we actually get something that's a text we we can tell that they're mixed up versions of three or four different stories, but we can't really tell exactly where the lines are. It's, it's like somebody, you know, had three different texts. They were trying to get into one and part one is mostly this other thing, but they obviously blended some other stuff in from other stories. And, you know, maybe they weren't the particularly best storytellers in the world. So it's not, perfectly consistent. And that's one thing that especially rereading at this time, I do really feel like there are at least three different quote unquote styles. Mm -hmm. I almost think of it as like three different yeah, yeah. authors in the tale of the student of the sun. Um, like the first one is definitely a different author. We're getting someone else here, but then the, the one who tells the story of the actual fights is a totally different yeah. voice from the first section. And that'd be interesting if people could <laughs> Kev, a, a, a critical interpretation of the tale of the student and the son. Yeah, you know, it, it would be a totally weird speculative argument of how many people wrote the student and the son. Who is the yeah. author J? Oh yeah, of yeah, the yeah, yeah. But it definitely yeah. has that feel to it, um, and it just it just adds to that sense of how how lost are these stories. Yeah, but that's that's something I hadn't actually thought of before until this time. It's like, oh, is he actually trying to write this as if there were different writers for the story? That's even cooler. Um, I don't know. I you know I couldn't say I could. Well, I do think that there was an ogre in the original story per se. I think that there's an ogre in the historical le uh, level of this story, and that may well be. But I yeah, think there's a lot. Be. Right. I think that there's a. This demonstrates a lot of transformation. Uh, since then, just calling it a, a, an ogre. And then, uh, well, when we get to this next uh, paragraph, I'll be able to explain so much more. So we'll do it. I, I can't wait. I'm giddy. Let's keep going. Know that the city is oppressed by an ogre who each year demands of it its fairest daughters, even as you have seen in your dreams. At this, the young man's eyes flashed and he demanded, who is this ogre and what form has he and where does he dwell? And the student will just finish up. Or do you have, do you want to stop there? No, 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 go on, go on. I'm ready. 
Okay. 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 So the story ends. One last paragraph. His name no man knows, for no man can approach near enough. His form is that of an aviscaput, which is to say that to men he appears as a ship, having upon its deck, which is in truth his shoulders, a single castle, which is his head, and in the castle a single eye. But his body swims in the deep waters with the skate and the shark, with arms longer than the most lofty masts, and legs like pilings that reach even to the floor of the sea. His harbor is an isle to the west, where a channel with many a twist and bend, dividing and redividing, reaches far inland. It's on this isle, so my lord teaches me, that the corn maidens are made to dwell, and there he rides at anchor in the midst of them, turning his eye ever to left and right to watch them in their despair. All right. Well, so the ogre, at, at a historical level, I think it is very easily to identify exactly who this person, creature, whatever is. But there's no point getting into it until we get to the next section. So I'm not going to. I'm going to just whet your appetite for the next for when we finish the next section. <laughs> Cosmologically, the ogre in the form of a navis kaput, a half submerged ship, half sea monster. This is the constellation Centaurus in the celestial southern hemisphere, the underworld itself. The stars of Centaurus have also been known as Minotaurus, a tip of the hat, cosmological roots of the Theseus myth. Navis Kaput, this name literally means ship's head. And Centaurus is located at the point where it would be the bow, if it had one, of the tremendous, massive constellation Argo Navis, Argo the ship, consisting of a stern, the constellation Puppis, a sail, the constellation Vila, and a bottom, Carina, the keel. And in the United States, the constellations of Argo Navis are essentially, at all times, entirely submerged below the horizon. For viewers in the continental United States, the most northerly stars of Centaurus rise above the horizon out of the sea in the early spring when the ogre makes his demand for tribute of the maidens. Finally, the story states that the ogre's body swims in the deep waters with the skate and the shark. And indeed, Crux, the Southern Cross beneath the horizon for viewers of the Northern Hemisphere, was seen by indigenous Australians as a shark chasing a stingray. Yeah, and so the Isle of the Ogre is the southern circumpolar region directly over Antarctica, where Argo Navis and Centaurus ride at anchor, orbiting at its edge among the Milky Way's corn maidens. I think that's, that's uh, pretty reliable little hooks in there, but we're going to get even more at uh, being able to, to launch off of, the, of basically those little tells that Wolf has left for us, those little breadcrumbs. That's very fun. That's pretty cool. Now, we do have to mention too, like, by the way, I didn't know about the, the, the shark and the skate thing was awesome. <laughs> that's, that's cool. <laughs> I didn't know that was it. But as far as the rest, it's just as far as the story goes, right? We haven't known anything about the ogre up to this point, but also now we find out you know, it just at the end of the second of five sections, we find out about this crazy monster thing, which is already weird. And it's even more strange. It's an odd mix of some kind of technology of a sort mm -hmm. and a monster. So already it's hard to say, you know, what kind of genre of story are we reading here? Is this some ancient, I mean, it seemed like towers and, you know, maybe something medieval, you know, who knows? It just had that feel to it. But now we've got a ship with a, a castle on it and, you know, a half man, half ship. What, what world are we in? Like we're not, we're no longer in a sort of totally faux ancient world. Cause now we've, we're mixing up some technology in here somehow. Um, but it's also just random <laughs> compared <laughs> to everything else that we know. Like why would they, why would they want why would we have to send the daughters every year? What does that ship have to do with a tower or a, a, a city that seemed like it was made of wise people? Why, why are they 
you know, there's just there's no basic logic, but also, well, it has a strange logic of myth because once again, myth is 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 dancing to another yeah, tune, exactly. one that you can't. If you if you're expecting a narrative uh, tune for it to to follow and and narrative rhythms, it doesn't yeah. have those. It has the the rhythms of of, of yeah, the cosmos absolutely. and time. And, and then also just to go back to my point about possibly different stories and authors, this just has a totally different feel right? This, this sort of strange half creature monster. We just haven't seen anything like that. It's like the story up to this point has been very quiet. It seems like, and mm -hmm. now we've got some big monster bad guy, but that's a totally different kind of story than what we were getting before. Yeah. So there's all that. So we also know this is, we're starting to get a bit more of the Theseus story showing up here because now we've got Another island where in the original story, Theseus is from Athens. Everything about the labyrinth happens out on the island of Crete. We've also got the the half man, half something, monster and or ship. Mm -hmm. So we do have the Minotaur showing up here. And now we're also finding out about the the corn maidens actually being some kind of tribute that's sent out to this other other thing. So so we yep. are starting to get more of a recognizable myth. And I think it, by this point it's not absolutely clear but i think it's it's to most you could tell that okay well this is something recognizable like this is finally something that we can at least say oh it's theseus whereas before this there's nothing at least i don't know of any other story that's supposed to be analogous that we're supposed to recognize but i do think that it's cool that it's not until what six pages into the story or so <laughs> that you even get something that is easy to recognize as, Oh, this is a retelling of an old myth in some way or another. Um, exactly, and so yeah. he waits long until you get in there to give you that, that one connection. Whereas usually you'd think, Oh, shouldn't we have this earlier to keep people reading? But no, <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah. So for the rest of it though, I still feel like at this point we don't have anything really solid to lay on to the action that's going on. You mentioned the possible connection to Malrubius with Severian. I think mm -hmm. that's there. I do think that this image of the ogre is supposed to, especially because it's half under sea is supposed to be connected somehow, or at least give you echoes of a bio, the way he's talked about the undines being oh, underwater. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, we got that connection. And then maybe, like I said, you have the connection to the very beginning of the two paths being sort of like Severian having to decide whether to, to stay in the guild or be kicked out into the wild wider world. Otherwise, I don't feel like at this point, especially when you read it the first time, there's no other real connection to what's been going on in the story or to Jonas quite so much. I do think there's a lot more later on, but I think up to this point, we didn't, haven't really seen. I think we have some opportunities uh, coming up in the next uh, sections, but we're not going to get to them. Yeah. Uh, because... You know, we need to break this up a little bit. So, yes, if you've been waiting for the Brown Book story so long, guess what? We're not finishing it tonight. <laughs> yeah, we're going to come back and do this. We're going to take in your comments, and uh, then we're going to continue on to uh, describe the rest of this story. Because you know, I, I can't do this on my own. Hold so on. hang with us. We're, we're, we're definitely going even slower through this one than we normally do. But I feel like at least for our first Brown Book story, we have to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, I, I, and you know, we'll just see. Uh, we may have someone may have a, a an idea, an end to end interpretation of this story that is so big and so important that you know we're going to have to have a special episode on it. Yeah. I don't know how this is going. I exactly. this is, but there's so much into this, and this is just the sort of chapter. And hey, too, maybe you know, I talked about how writers have to funnel everything. Maybe sitting there and forcing yourself to listen to us <laughs> painfully go through each little paragraph will help you funnel an idea. But this is just, I mean, we have spent an hour, two hours talking about chapters that are six pages long. And there's just no way we were going to finish this in one go. I am. This is exactly why I was and have been and continue to be so intimidated by Claw the Conciliator, because it's not the only section where we're going to have to go through this. Yeah, we still got the play coming up. <laughs> we're going to do this again when we come to the play. Yes. But if we're if 
if you can't count on us to like really belabor things <laughs> and, and take we so here? <laughs> much time, exactly. What's the purpose of this if not to do that? Exactly. So I do hope that you'll reach out to us with your ideas and your other comments and your thoughts and your corrections and your complaints and that you will please bring them to us on the Facebook group, the, the subreddit, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, email, or the Patreon site. And you can find out how to do all those things on the show notes. Just leave a review on Apple Podcasts, uh, tell your wolfering friends, certainly. But until you hear from us next, may the more favor you. Take care, everybody. And go listen to James talk about murder ballads on the Weird Christmas Podcast. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Sweet dreams to sunbeams find you. Sweet dreams that leave all worries behind you. But in your dreams, wherever they be, dream a little dream of me. Stars fading, but I linger on, dear. Still craving your kiss. I'm longing to linger till dawn, dear. Just saying this. Sweet dreams till sunbeams find you. Dreams that leave all worries behind you But in your dreams, wherever they be Dream a little dream of me What, what, is, it, what is it called when you, uh, when, when you, like, you just show like, uh, scenes? Like they turn off the lights and they turn back on there, There's a scene, they turn off the light It's an old form of uh, vaudeville stage play you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, um, not like one act plays. You're not like but, plays. Um, just scenes, but literally it, just yeah. scenes. I can't remember. Right in my remember. head. Um, Diorama. Oh oh, right? oh 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 yeah. Yep. Uh, do you hear that? By the way, I just hear you. I don't hear any other noise. Oh okay, you don't hear nope. the clunking around. It sounds like Emily has decided to move furniture again. Oh, and the thing, <laughs> but, you know, back. Go ahead. Go on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh the other. Well. It's, no, re no, really. I do, do go ahead because I'm going to yeah, go off. And I think like Plutarch says it's nine or something. I don't know. Anyway, I was, I was, I'm all mixed up now between rereading Plutarch's parts and some other stuff that I read and the bit of Plato that shows up and where he's in there. I'm all confused now. So we'll, we'll straighten out. And your point is <laughs> the dream man is not poltergeist, although maybe, although maybe it is. Could be, could be, or a friendly ghost or, or a Larry's, right? I have to admit, I keep looking. I haven't found one yet, but I keep looking for some sort of backdoor pirate way to use the OED. <laughs> like, there's got to be some way to cheat and get it, but, or I might just break down and get a subscription. I've, I've, how much does it cost a year? I mean, I may get that just, to myself. I'm just curious now. Um, uh, hundred well, bucks a year. So not terrible. It's, it's, it's been more than that on Spotify. Like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't prohibitively. It, it wasn't one of those, like so many academic journals where you're like, Oh, I should get a subscription to this. And it's like $400 a year, <laughs> yeah. for three editions. They laugh. Or at you can just go to your library. Yeah. Right. Oh no. <laughs> Have I lost connection? Hang on. Okay. I'm still recording. I'm going to finish what I'm doing. I, I probably could have. I just got, I just got panicked. I'm like, Oh, what, what happened? I don't want to live. Yeah. So. Okay, okay, here, let me but finish this part. Let me okay. Go, okay. Um, all right, that's all I got. Okay. And since it is the Christmas season, go listen to the Weird Christmas Podcast. And don't let Santa stuff you in his bulging, sweaty sack.